Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution? Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. Uh, welcome, everyone. John Corkin here. I'm the host of this show. And every week, I get to talk to smart CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of all kinds of different companies, ranging from Netflix to Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation, Blizzard, Lending Tree, Open Table. Go check out some of the archives, some great episodes back there. I'm also the co founder of Rise25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. Quick shout out to Jennifer Rotner from Elite Creative. She's the founder and CEO over there, and she helps companies with editing and publishing books. She's a good friend, and she introduced me to today's guest, who has an amazing story. His name is David Anderson. He went from president of his college fraternity to the White House and is now a seasoned entrepreneur, current chair of the Global Board of Directors of Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, made up of 16,000 members over 62 countries. I participated in EO. It's an amazing organization. I'm sure we're going to be saying all kinds of good things about it during this uh, interview, so you'll hear that. But their mission is to engage leading entrepreneurs to learn and grow and reach their full potential. It's also the founder of a 20-plus-year-old marketing agency off Madison Ave, and also author of the book, Leader is Not a Title. But first, before we get into that, this episode is brought to you by Rise25 Media, where we help B2B businesses to get clients and referrals and strategic partnerships with done-for-you podcasts and content marketing. If you're listening to this and you ever thought, should I do a podcast? I tell people all the time, yes, they absolutely should. And David, you've done a good job of getting your voice out there. I listened to a couple of your other podcast interviews, which were fun, where you're getting, you know, sharing some of your stories. So I'm looking forward to hearing, hearing your stories here today. But let's start with, you know, you and I have so many things in common. It's amazing. Entrepreneurship, EO, you know, which, which you obviously been involved a lot longer than I have, but I, I love the organization and the White House, of course. You know, we both kind of started our career at the White House in government, which is a natural path toward entrepreneurship. I'm, yeah. I'm joking, of course. <laughs> but you, you ended up working in, you, for two different presidents, and you did advance. So first of all, for those who don't know what advance is, which is the coolest job in politics, there's a lot of crappy jobs in politics, but advance is definitely the coolest one. So talk a little bit about what advance is, and then I want to hear some stories. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. I think we should get right out in the front and let everybody know we're both in politics, but we come from different sides of the aisle, right? Our yeah, but, uh, but, <laughs> but, the, but the experiences are so shared. It's amazing. I, I've Absolutely. interviewed others, um, you know, like Warren Rustin, for example, also in Arizona and also Big EOer, who, of course, was in the Ford White House. And it's amazing some of the parallels and similarities between different administrations. Not all administrations, but many administrations. <laughs> good point. Very good point. So thanks. let me first say thank you very, very much for having me on. Um, this is great. And I also want to shout out to Jennifer, who kind of brought us together as I'm looking at doing my own podcast. I can only hope I get as, as close to um, the, the success you've had doing that. So um, I, I'm excited to be here talking politics. Um, you know, I don't do talk a lot of politics anymore, but our experiences that you and I both shared, I think, are extremely relevant to our entrepreneurial journeys of what we've done. Um, so Advance, I worked in the executive office of the president. Advance is the teams of people that go out and do all of the planning, the logistics, but also a lot of the strategy around, um, in, in both of our cases, presidents, but governors, Congress, or whatever levels um, of politician it is for events that they're doing. And this can range from, you know, summits, international summits to campaign rallies. And it's it's not about just making sure the cars pull up in time and, you know, the plane lands in the right place. It's a lot about like, what's the picture of the day you want from the event? What's the message that you want um, the audience, uh, both on TV and in person to receive? So, you know, I kind of honestly got into marketing from a lot of the work that I did doing advanced work. It's a lot of public relations work. You're dealing with the media. So um, you're right. I would tell you it's the best job. And it's probably because you have immense access to your principal, president, governor, whatever it may be. You get to see things that very few people do 
And it's just an amazing experience to learn and grow. Um, I honestly want people say, you know, what do you wish you would have done different? I wish I would have paid, been more aware of what I was experiencing at my, I was, you know, early twenties, mid twenties doing this, but I've still taken a whole lot away from it. Yeah. You think back on it and just those little moments in between, you know, before an event, after an event in a hold room in the back, a little conversation. It's just amazing to witness those sorts of things when you have the, the leader of the free world and a, a president of another country, you know, having those conversations. Um, talk about some of the different countries that you did and, you know, what it was like represent because you're representing the White House. You're representing the United States of America when you show up there and you have to be on your, you know, your best game because of the way that you're representing the office and the country. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as uh, I was the, the lead advanced person, which basically meant I was the the lead person from the White House on the ground representing the White House and the, you know, the president on international trips is mostly what I did. I worked very closely with the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador of that country that we would do. You know, you travel on diplomatic passports and you get all of that. But you're right. You know, you have to really think that the actions that you take um, in a lot of ways, because I'm a marketing guy, I'm representing the brand in the work that I'm doing out there of how you interact, how you act. And I will tell you what, both presidents that I worked for would ask the people we work with, hey, how did these guys treat you? You know, Dave, do a good job, you know, these type of things. Because again, you are really, you know, representing, you know, the White House, the president or whoever you may be doing for you. And, um, you know, the simplest of little actions that you take can be interpreted completely wrong, especially when it comes to cultural issues around the world. Um, it, 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 you know, I really learned a lot from that. Yeah. Talk a little bit about um, the first President Bush that you worked for. Um, you know, the president I worked for, President Clinton and, and the first President Bush became good friends after they were both out of office and worked on a number of initiatives together. And I think that the first President Bush really built a, an amazing reputation, especially after he, he left office as kind of an elder state, statesman. But but what did you learn about leadership um, working for the first President Bush? Oh, I, you got four hours for <laughs> us to talk about this. Yes, you're right. I mean, talk about, um, you know, how close President Bush 41, we refer to, our, refer to him as, you know, 41 and 43. 43. So when I say 41 is the 41st president of the United States, you know, the rest of the family refers to Bill Clinton as their uh, their brother from another mother, you know, <laughs> type of thing. That's how close President Bush and Bill Clinton, you know, really got. And if you think about that, I mean, you know, President Bush was a one term president, lost, um, you know, that's a tough thing to do. It's, you know, you basically get fired by the American public. Um, yeah. You know, I, I work for a governor who's recalled, so I know yeah. what it feels like. <laughs> exactly. But for him to rise above that and to, you know, say, I lost, and he said these words, you, now you're my president. I think he said that in the, you know, the letter that I, one I was going to bring. I'm glad you next. brought up the letter. Yeah. Yeah. He so, he said so explain that I, what the letter was. So whenever a president, I believe it began with Ronald Reagan, if I'm not mistaken. But when one president would turn over, leave office and the new one, they would leave a private message in the, the desk in the White Hat, the desk in the Oval Office to the next president. And that tradition has continued. And, um, you know, the note 41 left for 42 at that point, President Clinton was you know, I wish you nothing but all success because now you are my president and I want you to succeed. And, you know, that, you know, one of the greatest things of leadership is being humble, being, um, showing vulnerability, you know, admitting that, you know, while things didn't work out, you're still here to support people. And that's very common in our businesses. If you have a high performing organization, not everybody's going to always agree. I'm going to be honest with you. If everybody on your executive team agrees with you as the CEO, you don't have a high-performing organization. 
Now, what a high performing organization is, is that you go into a room and you debate, and you battle and you, you know, you have robust conversations, but you leave a room united as a leadership team, you know, and that's what, you know, total leadership of a team is about is that we're going to debate, but we're going to leave. And I saw that, you know, clearly you saw that as from president to president, but again, because you've done some of it too. You, it was interesting when you said sitting in or standing in hold rooms, the things that you hear, um, man, not many people hear or see that type of stuff where, mm-hmm. you know, a cabinet secretary or a chief of staff or a secretary of defense, you know, will kind of question the leader and say, are you thinking about this properly? Is this, you know, have you considered this? You know, we need to do this just to disagree. Um, when it's president of the United States, where you know most people are just going to say yes sir, yes ma'am, we haven't had that yet. We will someday to our uh, female listeners out there. Um, it's really fascinating. And so the greatest takeaway, sometimes I talk to you not much. Just give me the signal to be quiet, John. Is, uh, I'm um, loving this. Leadership is all about the people you put around you. You want people who are smarter than you. You want people that will challenge you. The people who are going to tell you what you don't want to hear um, is what I was able to see. And I'm going to tell you one quick story. I think I've told you this before. I have a, it wasn't me, but a very good friend of mine who also did advance was with secretary card, chief of staff card. And um, the secretary asked uh, my friend, Greg, he said, Hey, where am I sitting at this dinner um, that we're all at? And Greg told him and he, he said, no, Greg, I need to be sitting next to the president because I'm one of I'm the guy who can kick him under the table, you know, if he's going down a wrong track. And, and it was done in a very respectful way. Secretary Card is one of the finest individuals I've ever met, including um, uh, Secretary Bolton, Josh Bolton after that. But that's what you as a leader need is to have those people around you. Yeah, yeah. A, a shortly, briefly on the note thing that extended to the staff eventually as well. When I left the White House in 2000, I wrote a note and left it in my desk. And I found out later that the person who inherited my desk, who became a writer after I w- had been in presidential letters and messages, had seen it and wanted it was before the Internet or was, the Internet was around, but you, there wasn't a Facebook and stuff. And I ended up coming through D.C. This is like a year into the second Bush administration. And we ended up getting lunch together. And now we're Facebook friends. <laughs> it's funny. We, we keep in touch. So it's really that's it's awesome. Really and, cool. you know, you and I, you know, you and I were in an era where politics was civil for the most part. And we worked for a common good. And again, we're not going to get into politics here, but that's the way it should be. You yeah. know, we do bad. So when I worked in D.C. and I'm older than you. Some of my absolute best friends I hung out with were Democrats and we would do battle during the day and then we would go drink at night and we would be like, oh, we won that vote. You lost that one. But it was for for a greater good. Yeah. And, um, you know, th- those were good days. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Um you know, when you are the lead advanced person, sometimes you have to be the guy who stands up to the leader of the free world and says, no, sir, I'm sorry, you can't go this way or you can't do that or you can't do that. What was that like having to be the one, you know, everyone's saying, give it to David, he'll tell him and you have to stand up there. There's 80 people in this line of people that are waiting and you have to be the guy who makes the decision. Yeah, um, I, I will tell you, knowing a lot about your boss who I actually have a lot of respect for and regard for, um, they were very different in that, 43 was about being on time. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Very and big difference boss, between those two. <laughs> yeah, your boss was a little bit more willing to stand around and linger. Yep. So it was always with 43. Let's go, Dave, why are we standing here? Let's go, let's go. You know, what are we doing here? And, and I'm like, gotta wait, you gotta wait, hold on. You know, I'm getting people yelling in my ear. You know, we <laughs> wear the earpieces and we talk into our sleeve and all of that kind of stuff um yeah. and doing yeah. that but i will tell you i remember an incident with um the 41st president president bush as he turned around while he was working a rope line and he asked me a question and he did not like the answer and while he was no one who would ever yell 
he gave me a look and he just said to me, why did you do that? And I felt like I was getting yelled at for like 30 minutes, you know, <laughs> when the president of the free just world starts, yeah, just qu starts questioning you on mm. what you did. You kind of, um, it, 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 it it gets your attention. Let me tell you. That's funny. That's funny. You know, one of the things that pe I, people ask me a lot about is, um, you know, what was it? Uh, what do you know about Bill Clinton's charisma? But I would take that beyond Bill Clinton because I've been around a lot of leaders, a lot of different leaders. Um, I've been around. I've been fortunate to be around Barack Obama. He has a different kind of charisma than the Bill Clinton, and and the Bushes have different kind of charisma. And you know, even though I I didn't vote for for the second Bush when he came around. I recognize he had tremendous charisma and, and just really a rabid following. So, so what is it being around those types of leaders? What do you think it is that, that enabled them to get people to follow them? Because the, ultimately being a president is about getting a, a country of people to follow your vision. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, I know many people to President Clinton from the Bush years who, while did not at all agree with his politics and stuff, but had a chance to meet him, that said it is virtually impossible to not like the man. You know, he said it's he said you cannot not like him yeah. because of his charisma and the way he drew you in and the way he was able to make you feel like you were the only person in the room when he was talking to you and go through that. And that's a special skill. And he's probably the best politician, you know, in my lifetime that there is. But that ability is how you um, get people to buy into your vision and to bring that sense of loyalty, and we're going to do this together. Now, both President Bush's, they were very different types of charisma, but, you know, they were both some of the most genuine people I knew. You know, 43 would joke around. He had nicknames for a ton of people. Yeah. And, you know, what, what you and I got to see that people didn't is the behind the camera rather in front of the camera. When I saw both of them sit with, um, you know, the families of, um, of of soldiers that had lost their life or the people in the points of light program that the first president Bush did. And you see that behind the camera stuff that there wasn't there for. That's how you really get to know people and you really understand and you see into their soul in a lot of ways of what you know, really matter. So many people just, you know, these are politicians to get votes, but all you and I both had the privilege of working for presidents who, who I do believe had a true sense of caring public service to do for the, the greater good. You, you spoken very high. You mentioned Andy Card. You've spoken highly of him in other interviews. What was it about Andy Card? Of course, Andy Card was um, the second president Bush 43's first chief of staff. What was it about yeah. him that was so that you were so impressed with. Well, he, and he was deputy chief of staff in the 41st White House also, then went on to be secretary of transportation. Just very genuine, you know, very, very genuine, not one ounce of being full of himself. Um, you know, he's, you know, some would argue the second most powerful person in the world, even more than the vice president. And, you know, him and Josh Bolton after, um, you know, Andy Card would, you know, we'd be standing in hallways and they'd be like, Dave, what can I do? You know, is there anything you need? You know, it, they just were genuine people. And that's what I took away, even at my young age, that it doesn't, you know, leaders, not a title goes all the way back to that, that, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard the stories of some uh, chiefs of staffs that are complete assholes. That doesn't make them a leader. You know, a leader is when they, um, you know, they have the same level of respect and regard for a lowly advanced person like me versus, you know, their counterparts in foreign countries, other cabinet members, you know, whatever. Um, I, I read a, uh, a quote once or somebody told me a quote. I'm going to butcher this, but um, the true um, the true showing of somebody's character is how they treat people that can do absolutely nothing for them. Mm. You saw that in, you know, those type of Colin Powell, the same way, just genuine people who care that aren't full of themselves, 
And, you know, are, they're like, Dave, what car do you want me to go to? Where do you want me to go? Tell me where I can be a room here. Nothing pretentious yeah. about any Condoleezza Rice. Yeah. One of the smartest people you did not, her own staff would debate, argue about who was going to brief her because they knew she knew more than they did. <laughs> um, but wow. the nicest lady in the world, you wow. know, really just great. Wow. Wow. Um, I, I want to get to talking about the entrepreneurial endeavors, but before we do that, I do want to ask about um, 9-11 because after 9-11, you were, uh, well, you'd started your company at this point, but, you know, as we've said, you know, once you're in politics, you kind of stay in it. They keep you in. It's, uh, you know, kind of like the godfather. Um, and so you were still doing these international trips. What were trips like with the president after 9-11 compared to before? Yeah, it was crazy. Now, I was not with President Bush on 9-11, but I have many friends who were. And you hear them talk about that day. It's it's kind of crazy. It's it, it's very emotional. Carl Rove gave a speech once that I was at where he was asked about that day. And he spoke for probably 20 solid minutes on it. And you couldn't hear a pin drop. And, you know, he was right there with them. Um, but, you know, in a lot of ways, the world changed on that day and more it did not kind of it did change from the world of advance. We went from security to hyper security. We went from, you know, uh, motorcades, just regular motorcades to motorcades with a vehicle in it that would check the air, sniffing the air, you know, for anthrax and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff on the days immediately after we went to, um, you know, just uber background checks like you're familiar of to be even in the vicinity of the president it, it, in so many ways it's really sad that the world had got to that level that we had to protect um you know not only our country but our leaders to such a level um you know like that and you know some of those things remain in place some of them as time has passed die down but um uh, and especially with when you're with the Secret Service, everywhere you go, you know, their job is to protect. And so there's yeah. an uber sense of every, you know, pathway you take, every where every car pulls into park, where, you know, the random person walking around it, um, you know, yeah. it significantly changed how presidents travel. And just huge barriers that blocked off street after street after street blocked off. You just can't get into these these zones at all anywhere near where the president is located. Usually, um, let's let's pivot to talking about uh, your marketing company. Um, and and I'm fascinated fascinated by this because I went from government uh, to law and then entrepreneurship. But um, was it was it challenging to to make that pivot and and you know, in particular, how did you, you know, learn about starting an entrepreneur, you know, starting your own, your own venture after having spent years in politics? So when I left um, the White House, I wanted to get out of D.C. and I moved back to Arizona and I really had not a clue what I was going to do. I really didn't. And then uh, still a very good friend of mine, his name's Gordon James. He has a PR firm, Gordon C. James PR. He grew up in Arizona and he had a PR agency. He had already left the White House um, and said, hey, would you like to start um, an office for me in Arizona? I may want to move back there someday. And so I kind of I wasn't a pure entrepreneur then, but I did kind of do a startup for an entrepreneur. And I learned a ton um, doing that. And he gave me immense ability to do that. And then over time, you know, another opportunity came up. I went to work for an agency. And then in a story, I can tell another time that would take a lot of time, I got fired. Um, and I was kind of like, hey, I'm going to go try this entrepreneur thing. So myself and my business partner, um, you know, we, we call ourselves a VC funded company. VC being Visa cards um, <laughs> that we used to um, start the agency. And it was just jumping in both feet, um, made just about every mistake you can make in this world, um, hard knocks, but just perseverance. And I will tell you, politics taught me the importance of just perseverance, you know, going forward every day, you know. Poll numbers are up one day, down the next, up the next, right. down the next. You're you don't have a chance. Look at you know President Biden. 
You know, the, the, nobody gave him a shot at it before South Carolina. And all of yeah. a sudden it changed literally overnight from this guy doesn't win South Carolina. He's out to, you know, winning South Carolina and going yeah. on and taking the nomination. And so, you know, politics is a lot of perseverance and just going forward and not giving up. You know, I, I joke with people that my startup experience, my dot com experience was, um, you know, working for uh, one president who um, was impeached and a governor who was recalled. Those were my my <laughs> setbacks. Right. And so like that was my kind of personal experience with the dot com failure. But one of the things that's hard coming out of an early success in your career is being willing to take chances later in your career. So what do you think was it in you that you emerged from the White House? Here you are. You've been lead advance guy for the White House. You've had the president of the United States who is is listening to you. And then you get fired and you have to hustle for clients. Some people wouldn't be willing to tolerate that. That would just be too much. It would not be acceptable. So what do you think it was that allowed you, enabled you to continue fighting through all that? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I, I have to tell you a story along that. I hope people don't get tired of our stories, but my business partner and I started our company and about week two into it. We were making calls to people. Hey, we'd like to meet you and tell you what you kind of I'm old again, going through the Rolodex type of thing. And he'll still tell this story that one day I go, this sucks. When you work for the White House, everybody takes your call. Oh, they yeah. Pull people out of meetings to take your call. And I yep. was getting like rejection after rejection after rejection um, going through. And, you know, I'll be honest, I had the pressure on me of um, a baby on the way. You know, I had, That'll put my some wife pressure and I on. had been married for about two and a half, three years. And my wife is amazing and I'm only where I am today because of her. Um, but I kind of promised her that we would be at a point, you know, within nine months that she didn't have to go back to work. Um, we weren't going to be living large, but she wouldn't have to go back to work. And she said she would. But luckily, you know, I think we were able to take home like, you know, $1,500 a month to pay enough for the mortgage. And, you know, we had a little, I think that was more than I made at the white house. I don't know about you, but that probably, <laughs> yeah, more. that's very yeah. true. Yeah. That's very true. Um, and so it's just, you know, I think if you're an entrepreneur, um, you just better accept that it's going to be a rough road and it's perseverance. It's the unwillingness to give up. And, um, you know, again, I, you know, I saw that in politics. I saw that in other things and I just kind of absorbed it is the best, you know, yeah. the best way now, to explain it. Let's talk about, you've had a couple of other entrepreneurial ventures along the way, some of which did well, continue to do well and others of which haven't. Let's start with the ones that didn't. So you had a, a publishing company startup that was a, a learning experience. It was a magazine that you started. Um, what are some of the lessons and takeaway, takeaways from that experience? Uh, three takeaways. The first one is just because you have one success does not mean your second and third will be successful. Um, don't get so full of yourself that, oh, look, my first company did great. I'm crushing it. The next one will be just as easy because history doesn't always repeat itself. The second was, is that Roger and I, my business partner, brought on a third partner to start this other business, and it was a horrible relationship. And the importance of knowing who you're going into business with, um, I learned the hard way that, um, because I had one partnership that has worked out great now for 24 years, that every other one would, we weren't aligned, there was a lot of, um, you know, challenges um, that went on that. And then the third thing I learned- but actually, is, Before you get to that yeah. third one, what would you do differently to vet a potential business partnership with the knowledge that that one didn't go well? So in other words, what, if, if I'm thinking about partnering with someone, what should I be thinking about before I partner with someone? Well, two things is, is my business partner, Roger, and I worked at the last agency that I got fired from for two years. So we got to know each other really really well. And we knew each other's strengths and weaknesses really well. The new partner, we didn't know that well at all. The other thing I went, when I'm asked, how have you made a partnership last for almost 25 years now? Roger and I, when we started, we sat down 
And we clearly defined who had the final say on what things in business. Um, even though we were equal partners in that kind of stuff, the business side, the finances, he all we talk about, we could get into an argument, yell and chat. But at the end of the day, it was my decision. And same thing goes on the creative, the, the client side with him, where there are things that he was stronger at. And while I may not agree and would jump up and down yelling at, he had the final say. And these that has lasted for 24 years. And, you know, there, there, there's a lot of respect for that um, made it work. We didn't do this with this person. We weren't aligned. Um, he I he, he worked really hard, but I would say we had different work ethics um, of what we what we wanted to do. Yeah. And then um, that's great lesson. And then I think there was a third lesson, which I interrupted you that you said you got from that experience. Yeah. The third lesson was do your homework on the industry you're getting into. Um, again, you know, we started a very successful, we've been fortunate beyond belief with the marketing agency and even back then. So we were like, oh, publishing. How tough can that be? Let's do it. You know, we jump right in, even though the third partner had experience in that. Roger and I didn't do our homework on really understanding what it was going to take, how long. And, um, you know, I've unfortunately I'm a slow learner and I've done that again in other startups where I didn't, you know, you, you know, as well as I do as entrepreneurs, we have the squirrel syndrome. You know, we race off with the next shiny object. Um, do your homework, really understand what you're getting into before you, um, you know, dive deep into it. Yeah. And now you have another company, Lighthouse PE, which is um, uh, a SaaS based software company. How did you do that differently that that has been more of a success? Yeah, well, that's still I'll put in the startup category. We're a couple years in now we are um, post revenue. So we have money coming in um, and, you know, we built the right team. We have the right team. As a matter of fact, I started out as the CEO of that for the first three years. And then I finally realized I'm not qualified to grow uh, a SaaS-based company. I don't have the knowledge. So we brought in a CEO with the experience to do that um, from the lesson I've learned. So it's we surrounded ourselves with the right people. We brought in the right expertise. I'll be honest, I didn't do all of the homework to the extent I should have before we started it. So there were a lot of hard lessons learned getting to where we are today. Um, But we kind of took those learnings from, you know, past mistakes. Yeah. And then um, off Madison Ave, I want to ask about that. One of the things, well, first, I want to know how you got the name for it, because, um, you know, a lot lot of companies out there will try and um, be a lesser version of their competitors. And it to me, and maybe I'm, I'm reading into this, it seems like you're embracing your different differentness, right? You're, you're based in Arizona. You're not even in New York, right? So is, is that, was that the idea behind it? It absolutely was. It was, we're in Arizona. Um, and it was that you don't have to go to Madison Avenue, New York to get the same type of talent expertise. My business partner, Roger, came from, came from a Can Erickson worldwide. They still may be, but they were the largest agency in the world at that point. Um, So what you said is exactly right. You know, we were like, let's embrace it, you know. And when people say, oh, that's really interesting, you know, how did you come to that name? It was like, look at the caliber of people that we have. They all have the same type and in some cases better than what you're going to get on Madison Avenue. And it's going to be a lot cheaper. Um, And so, yeah, that's exactly we kind of embrace that you know, our location and where we are. And that's like commonplace after the pandemic to, to, you know, people don't think as much about, well, where's my agency located? Are they in midtown Manhattan? Right. You know, but, but 22 years ago, that must've been maybe a harder sell. Absolutely. 1998. I mean, the internet was in its infancy at that point. If you, you know, if you go back and look at, you know, 97, 98, where the internet was then versus now, it's, you know, it's completely different. I mean, the internet um, and especially COVID has pushed us to a global economy, a global world more than, you know, who I think we could ever imagine. A good friend of mine who's an EO member, um, uh, Joaquin Cadero out of, in um, Guatemala, he said to me, 
It's been many months now. He said, you know, Dave, COVID made the future come faster. And I 100% believe that. And probably by a factor of 10 years, if you really want to get down to it, of how literally almost overnight, we went from a world where 90% of all people went to an office every day, they did their work to almost the entire world working from home, other than the manufacturing. And, you know, there were things you have to go to the office for. Um, but it's been fascinating to watch. It's been difficult, but I think we'll all look back and go, wow, look at what we experienced and what we accomplished. Yeah. And um, I want to ask when you came to EO, because a lot of um, a lot of EOers I interview, they had some breaking point or something where they needed help. And is that how you were drawn to EO or was it a friend? How did you end up in the community? Yeah. You know, I was a member of Vistage before EO. And it was a great group, super expensive and stuff. And my forum and Vistage kind of broke up and I really kind of wasn't doing anything. And then somebody talked to me about EO and it was, so I joined in 2009. So we were starting to come out, you know, the hardest part of the recession was um, over um, but I needed help and I knew, I mean, I was beat down. I was exhausted coming out of 07, 08. And I just needed to be around people that could, you know, that could, quite honestly could feel my pain commiserate with me, but also give me, you know, that opportunity to learn and grow. And because I had, it was only in Vistage. I don't even know if it was a full year. I got a taste of it. And so understanding the forums that make up EO um, was really what drove it, drove me to it. Yeah. Now, um, uh, we were chatting beforehand and you said that you at this point are entirely removed from day-to-day -day operations with, with your business, which is kind of the place that all entrepreneurs want to get to, or most do. Um, but you also had some false starts uh, building towards that point. So what did you try that didn't work to get yourself removed from the business so you weren't in an operational role? Yeah, yeah, I am very fortunate that both companies, Off Madison App and Lighthouse, that there's GM, CEO that run, you know, both of those individual um, um, companies. And while I'm still involved at the finance level on some aspects and that, I have no day-to-day -day role with clients or operations, workflow, any of that. And, um, you know, it took me three tries, honestly, to get this right. The first one, I hired a, a, a former agency president from a different market and brought him in to kind of take over. And the mistake I made was I hired him. I brought him in. Like, let's just say it was a Monday. And on Monday afternoon, I was like, I'm out. Good luck, you know. Hope all goes well, you know. Wait, that, that's time. not that's not the approach you recommend, is what you're saying? Yeah, <laughs> no, I would highly recommend uh, not recommend because within six months, um, uh, that person was gone, and I think three of the five leadership team members had left. Um, you know, that people you'd had, hired, maybe, people you'd hired yeah. had left. Oh man, yeah. that's painful. Yeah, they came in because the new guy was so miserable and trashed our culture. I could go on on that. So I jumped back in and, you know, we kind of got it back up. And then the next time, and this is kind of a relevant story because I know there's a lot of companies out there that are doing EOS or scaling up and stuff like that. And we went um, to doing EOS and I, again, was now ready to not be involved day to day. So I didn't take a visionary role or an integrator role. And I didn't really participate in any of the L10s or anything. And um, I backed out too much. I didn't have the level of accountability needed. I wasn't engaged enough. And within six, seven months, um, uh, Back it, it, was, it was a train wreck. Mm. Um, again, several leadership team members left um, for a variety of reasons. And the second half of 2019 was not great. So I jumped back in and this time I looked at it as a marathon versus a sprint to get out of the weeds of the day to day. And, um, you know, really was involved, helped. We now have, um, her name, Sasha, who runs our day to day 
of the of the organization and she came up through the ranks she understood the organization she had a great relationship with most of the staff um, that, that we had and I really helped mentor and coach her and I and I still am very I do one-on-ones with her all the time there's through the EOS we have level of accountabilities now to make sure that um, you know things are getting done and moving in the right direction. Um, I learned that I can help her learn and grow to get messages across and do things, not doing it the way that I would, letting her do it in her ways, but it was much more of a transition into this role. And you know, she's fantastic. I hand hired a CEO, like I talked about on. Lighthouse PE because I just wasn't qualified to do it. He's doing a great job. And, um, you know, things were moving in the right direction. Yeah. You know, and, and that is a natural transition into the types of coaching consultant that you do for other entrepreneurs. Do you find that when you're helping other founders or you're helping other executive teams that they have a similar, similar to you kind of, um, uh, eagerness to, to get through something faster than they should. And that you're having to say, okay, guys, one thing after another, this is going to take a little while, but we'll do it right. 100%, you know, it is definitely a marathon, not a sprint. And, you know, it's also, and the thing that we as entrepreneurs are always the best at, it's ensuring a level of accountability, just because you're not involved anymore. doesn't mean that you still aren't monitoring and watching you kind of like we're too small of a company to have a a, a board of directors but you kind of become the chairman of the board where your job is is to you know be an independent eye watching over the business of what's going on with the right kpis the right you know processes you put in place to move forward um it's not just about you know here's where you deposit the check um, you know, I may come by cause I need to make copies, um, on certain days, you know, mm-hmm. you have to, you have to play a role. David, you traveled the world as lead advance, uh, representing the president, representing the white house, representing the United States of America and in, in glo- you know, in countries around the globe. And now you're, you just got back from a, a trip to Switzerland. You're traveling the globe, representing entrepreneurs organizations, 16,000 members worldwide. You're going to different countries, whether it's virtually in person, representing that organization. What is it like for you to be in this role now, uh, reflecting back on your previous experience? Well, great question. I will tell you, it's almost like uh, the, 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 the gods knew what my role was going to be in EO because of the training I got through what I did working, you know, in the White House and doing things so prepared me for what I'm, you know, doing now. Um, you know, my greatest learnings from all of that is understanding the cultural differences around the world. Um, you know, I, I'm just going to be blunt and honest. You know, we as as North Americans um, have a tendency to think that, you know, the way we do things is the way everybody else should do things. And, you know, I have learned so much about different cultures and how people interact and how they, um, you know, how they interact, not only in business, but as family members and how that transcends across so many lines the cultural aspects of what I've learned in both of those roles has been a learning that you can't really put, uh, you know, a price on. I also, you know, even within EO, you know, you have to mediate things um, between not only member to member, but members in different countries and East versus West sometimes of, you know, how, how that's done. So it's in a lot of ways, it's a very diplomatic role. It's like, a, you know, almost like an ambassador thing where, and that's really how I look at my role. I'm the organization's number one ambassador. We have an amazing CEO. There is a ton of great leaders in our organization, um, you know, that goes on. But I would say it, it's a privilege um, in both cases, um, you know, to, to do, what, do what I do in the past, but now also as, as the global chair for EO. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of gratitude. So if if you look around at your your peers and your contemporaries, however you want to define that, it could be others in your industry, it could be you know EO forum mates, it could be members of the global board, it could be mentors along the way. Who do you respect? Who do you admire that's doing good work? That's a great question. And you and I talked about this a little bit beforehand. So the, the, the first one, and I'm going to tell you why, because I this isn't the answer you're necessarily looking for. Let me put it this way. But the number one first one um, is my wife, Debbie. And the reason that is, is because if you're an entrepreneur, if your spouse, you know, partner, whatever it is, isn't side by side with you, supportive of what you're doing, um, willing to support you in the best of times and the worst of times when, hey, honey, sorry, we're not taking a, a paycheck for the third straight month. You know, it's not going to work. The, the, the stress that it causes at home and in personal lives. So, you know, the credit to our success, my, you know, our success goes to her and Roger's wife also because they've allowed us to do this and support. So utmost respect for those spouses, partners, um, family members that stand side by side with entrepreneurs and say, I'm with you no matter what is, is the most important thing. After that, I look to some of the people in EO, Gary Bushkin, who is one of my greatest friends and an EO Arizona member. He, when I came into EO, I got right on the board. They needed a marketing person. And Gary was the president of the chapter at that point, just like you're on the board now. Gary was um, the president. Gary has been a mentor and somebody I go to since the day I started there 12 years later. I would not be chairman of this great organization without Gary, uh, who has always, you know, been by me going there. Um, yeah. So, you know, I would say those two, um, but there is a long, long list of people whose, um, you know, shoulders I stand on that have allowed me to get to where I am now. That's great. Uh, leader is not a title is the book. Uh, what inspired you to write the book? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a great, I, I just, I was talking to a friend one day and he had written a book and I was like, I've got nothing to write about. I have no book to, you know, and he's like, that's not true. Really think about what you've learned. And my leader's not a title is a culmination of what I learned. You know, I worked on, on Capitol Hill also before I ended up in the White House. I worked for, um, I was a staff appointee to two presidential commissions where I worked for an admiral, a full colonel, where I worked with generals. Um, and it's a culmination of what I saw in my, in, in that, that government life versus what I saw from other great leaders in EO and people around me. Um, who embodied kind of the things I talked about of Andy Carr, Josh Bolton, Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, those people. Um, I just kind of got, got to that point. Yeah, that's great. Um, David, this has been great. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Where can people go to connect with you, learn more about your, your coaching and your various work that you're involved in? So dwaleadership.com is the website for the work that I do on the consulting and that you can find me on LinkedIn, not hard to find. Well, Dave Anderson, I guess there are a lot of them, but Dave Anderson, Arizona, um, LinkedIn is another great way, um, you know, to find me And worst case, you know, just look up off Madison app. You'll always find me. Um, I'm still on there with links there. Excellent. David, thanks so much. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you for listening to the smart business revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution Podcast.